Hello everybody, Roger says hey. I've got my coffee and another Napoleon video, so let's get started. We're on part four of Napoleon's Marshals, and so far Bernadotte has my top spot. Now I have a feeling that DeVoe is going to unseat him eventually because he is the marshal that impressed me the most from the Napoleonic Wars series, but we shall see. So far I'm really liking my boy Bernadotte. Now you guys answered my questions in the last video, and I do want to highlight a few of your comments just as a very, very quick review before we get into this new video. After all, it's been a little while since we've done this. <laughs> In the last video they referenced the hundred days and I had no idea what that was referring to. I thought it was Napoleon's exile, but what? Rita Das says actually the hundred days is not about Napoleon's exile, but his return from his first exile and the days between that return all the way to Napoleon's second and final abdication after the disaster at Waterloo. So I guess it's the hundred days between when he left his exile, his first exile, and Waterloo. So in effect like his second emperorship. I also had a lot of comments in previous videos about Unado. That is how you say his name, right? And how everybody kind of like seemed to like him. And, and in the last video, when I learned about him, there wasn't anything like that super stood out to me other than he got wounded like 36 times or something which I guess can command a lot of respect from your men so I understand that. Acranius Dominus says that he was just an extremely likable guy and Basically, he implied that he commanded a lot of respect because of all of his wounds. He said that he's like a 19th century Terminator. <laughs> and there were some other comments in there that also said that he kind of fought on the front lines with his men. He could like to get right in there in the action. So I kind of get it. I was also kind of surprised to learn that there were Bourbon kings in multiple countries. <laughs> I really have no idea how like European monarchs work, but apparently there are a lot of like intermarriages and you know, they just kind of like move around from country to country a little bit. A MAGA Fox says, if you think the Bourbons were any everywhere, it would be fun if you take a look at the Hasbergs. I have heard of the Hasbergs before, um, even previous to doing these videos. I've, I guess I've heard them in school or just, you know, around. I guess, I'm guessing they're another, like, huge monarch family that just kind of spread themselves out all over Europe. And I remember the painting that they showed of the cavalry charge at Eilau, and I just remember kind of being shocked at how many horses I saw. Mike Stauffer says at Eilau the cavalry charge was about 10 to 12,000 strong, one of the greatest of all time. That painting depicted it looks like to me a few thousand horses. I had no idea it was 10 to 12,000 though. That is huge. And a lot of you also told me that that wasn't uncommon in history, that there were a lot of really big great cavalry charges. So I guess I'm just super ignorant <laughs> about cavalry. Okay, so we're gonna leave your comments there. I appreciate you guys answering my questions. And again, if I have any more questions that come up in this video, I would appreciate you uh, answering them in the comments below. Also, before we jump into this, a quick reminder to like and subscribe if you haven't done that yet. And also check out my social media and my Discord in the links in the description and in my pinned comment. So now that that's out of the way, let's check out Napoleon's Marshals Part 4. Let's see who makes the list this time. And let's see if anybody comes up and knocks Bernadotte off the number one spot for me. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brune, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan, Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, Marmont, Saint-Cyr, Oudineau, Victor, and Murat. Nine. Marshal Bessier. If I had Bessier's with me at Waterloo, my guard would have brought me victory. Okay, so he likes Bessier. That's good. Jean Baptiste Bessier was the son of a surgeon with a relatively prosperous upbringing in southwestern France. When the French Revolution began, he volunteered for the National Guard and was sent to Paris to join the King's Constitutional Guard, along with his old school friend, Georges Murat. This unit was soon disbanded, but Bessier remained in Paris and was among the soldiers defending the Tuileries Palace when it was stormed by the mob on the 10th of August 1792. 
In the aftermath, he needed to get out of Paris in a hurry, so he volunteered to fight on the Pyrenees front. His bravery and good sense won him a commission in the 22nd Chasseurs, and he distinguished himself at the Battle of Boulou. Transferred to Italy, his friendship with Murat got him noticed by the army commander, General Bonaparte, who was impressed enough to make him commander of his new bodyguard, known as Les Guides de Bonaparte. Bessie it's good to have friends in high places, I guess. Yeah, distinguished himself as a cavalry commander in Italy, and later Egypt, winning promotion to brigadier and loyally supporting Napoleon at every turn. He became one of the few men that Napoleon regarded as a true friend. Hmm. When Napoleon became first consul of France in 1799, he rewarded Bessières with command of the elite Consular Guard cavalry, which he led with devastating effect at Marengo the next year. In 1804, Bessières became a marshal, less for any great military achievement than for being a loyal member of Napoleon's inner circle. Bessières himself was well-liked, kind, well-mannered and generous, a pious Catholic and social conservative, who liked to powder his hair in the old style. His young wife, Marie-Jeanne, was also a favourite at court, doted on by Napoleon and Empress Josephine. In 1805, Bessières commanded the Imperial Guard. In December that year, at the Battle of Austerlitz, he played a crucial role repelling the Russian Guard at the battle's climax. At Eylau in 1807, his squadron supported Murat's mass cavalry charge and made their own disciplined attacks to cover his withdrawal. However, Bessières' opportunities for glory were limited. Napoleon always held the guard back as his last reserve, as at Friedland. In 1808, Bessières received his first major independent command in northern Spain. That May, the country erupted in revolt against the French. Bessières reacted quickly and decisively, securing key towns and roads. He then attacked Spanish forces at Medina de Rio Seco, winning a crushing victory against an enemy that outnumbered him two to one. But once the immediate crisis had passed, he hesitated and failed to exploit his victory. When Napoleon arrived in Spain, Bessières was given command of the Reserve Cavalry, a role he retained for the war against Austria in 1809. In May, Bessières and his cavalry were among the first across the Danube, with Massena occupying the village of Aspern on his left, and Lannes holding Essling on the right. When the Austrian commander, Archduke Charles, launched a massive and unexpected counterattack, Bessières, outnumbered four to one, made a series of desperate charges, helping to save the army from disaster. It came at a high cost. Bessières and his cavalry performed bravely. But that night, a long-running feud with Marshal Lannes nearly came to blows when Lannes accused Bessières of hanging back. The matter went no further, as Lannes was fatally wounded the next day. Hmm. Bessières commanded the cavalry again at Wagram, leading a major attack to cover Massena's redeployment to the left wing. As the charge began, a cannonball killed Bessières' horse and injured his leg. A rumour reached the Imperial Guard that Bessières was dead. Some old veterans began to weep for their old commander, until they were assured he was only wounded. That was quite a cannonball, Napoleon told Bessières. It reduced my guard to tears. As a hmm. devout Catholic, Bessières was critical of Napoleon's divorce from Empress Josephine, leading to a short spell out of favour. In 1811, he was sent back to Spain to command the Army of the North. He found an impossible situation, a widespread insurgency and insufficient troops and supplies. He wrote bluntly to Napoleon, stating that the French must give up territory, something the Emperor would never allow. For all his piety and refined manners, Bessières ordered his share of executions and reprisals, 
in his attempt to pacify northern Spain. Brutal methods used by many French commanders in this conflict. Later that year, he joined forces with Marshal Massena's Army of Portugal to take on Wellington's army at the Battle of Fuentes de Onoro, but was widely blamed for refusing to send in his cavalry to support Massena's attacks. Unfortunately for Napoleon, this was typical of how many marshals behaved in his absence. They'd rather watch another marshal fail than help them to win all the glory. In 1812, Bessières accompanied Napoleon into Russia, commanding his guard cavalry. Since the guard was kept in reserve, he saw little action until the retreat, when he led the advance guard, clearing a path for the survivors. The disaster in Russia left Bessières severely demoralised, but he was resolved to do his duty, now serving once more as Napoleon's cavalry commander in Marshal Murat's absence. On the 1st of May 1813, Bessières was scouting enemy positions before the Battle of Lützen, when a cannonball hit him in the chest, killing him instantly. His death robbed Napoleon of a dependable commander and one of his last remaining friends. It is surely a great loss for you and your children, Napoleon wrote to his widow, but an even greater one for me. Um, this, this painting of, of them, I'm, I'm assuming this is him after being killed, I'm not sure, but uh, his chest looks awful good for being hit by a cannonball, just saying. Also, I'm just imagining like this huge gaping hole in the middle of his chest. Eight. Marshal MacDonald. Good and brave, but unlucky. Okay. Jacques. Oh, I feel like this guy was in Spain, right? And he did. He had a bunch of like uh, bad battles or something in Spain, if I remember right. Uh, his his image looks familiar to me, but I I could be wrong about that. Jack Macdonald's father was a Scotsman who'd supported Bonnie Prince Charlie's bid to seize the British throne in 1745. After this ended in defeat at Culloden, the family fled to France. Inspired by tales of the Trojan War, Macdonald chose a military life and became a lieutenant in Dillon's Irish Regiment, a French unit made up mostly of Irish émigrés. In the Revolutionary Wars, he won a reputation as a hard-working, intelligent and brave officer, and served as aide-de-camp to General de Maurier, commanding the Army of the North. He distinguished himself in that general's famous victory at Jemap, paving the way for rapid promotion from lieutenant to general in just two years. He led his division well during campaigns in Holland and Germany, and formed a close bond with one of France's most successful commanders of this period, General Moreau. In 1798, he was sent to Rome as governor, and later commanded the army of Naples. Summoned north the following year to reinforce Moreau's army of Italy, he was nearly killed in a skirmish with Austrian cavalry, and while still suffering from his wounds, his army was defeated at the Trebia by a larger coalition force commanded by the great Russian general Suvorov. But Macdonald's own conduct won approval from General Bonaparte, among others. Later that year, he assisted Napoleon's seizure of power in the coup of 18 Brumaire, ensuring the loyalty of the troops at Versailles. He was rewarded with an army command in Switzerland, and that winter led his men through the Alps to attack the Austrians in Italy. His march was far more challenging and dangerous than Napoleon's, but was never immortalized in quite the same way. In 1804, Macdonald's former commander, General Moreau, was arrested and charged with involvement in a plot to assassinate Napoleon. Macdonald stood up for his friend's reputation, an act of loyalty typical of the man, but disastrous for his career. Moreau was exiled, Macdonald was placed under police surveillance, and retired to his country estate in disgrace.
Did Moreau actually, like, plot to kill Napoleon, or was that just made up? For some reason, I don't remember that in the Napoleonic Wars, if they mentioned it. Also, I think I got this guy, I got MacDonald confused with another marshal that was in Spain. I'm pretty sure, because they're not talking about Spain at all in this, so... Five years passed before Napoleon, desperate for experienced senior commanders, asked him to serve as military advisor to his 27-year-old stepson, Prince Eugène, now commanding the Army of Italy. Macdonald and Eugène worked well together, driving back the Austrians, and by an awesome feat of marching, joined Napoleon near Vienna, in time for the Battle of Wagram. The second day of the battle was Macdonald's moment. Entrusted by the Emperor with the main attack on the enemy centre, he formed his troops into a giant, open-backed square, and advanced into a hail of fire. Napoleon, watching through his telescope, exclaimed several times, What a brave man! What a brave man! Macdonald's costly attack helped to secure a great victory. The next day, Napoleon went to find him on the battlefield, and greeted him with the words, Let us be friends from now. You have acted valiantly and given me the greatest services. On the battlefield of your glory, where I owe you so large a part of yesterday's success, I make you a Marshal of France. You have long deserved it. In addition, Macdonald received the title Duke of Taranto, and a large pension. But as time would prove, his loyalty remained to France, not to Napoleon. Macdonald spent an unhappy year in Catalonia, commanding troops in what he regarded as an immoral war. In his memoirs, he even praised the noble and courageous resistance of the Spanish. In 1812, he was given command of 10th Corps for the invasion of Russia. This corps, composed of German troops and reluctant Prussian allies, guarded the left flank of the invasion, and had a relatively quiet campaign. In December, the Prussians... You know, um, between this, these videos and the Alexander the Great videos that I'm doing, I, it's just hitting me, and I, this, this is dumb, that I haven't really processed this prior to this before, but the, the amount of travel that these guys do in the military and just how much of the world that they get to see, it's just, it's just crazy. Like, especially back in this time where, you know, they didn't have planes or automobiles to get them from, you know, point A to point B. These guys were probably traveling by horseback for the most part. It's just nuts just how much they're like zigzagging around to different parts of the world and like i know that's that's like one of the selling points of the military at least over here was you get to travel and see the world so it's not like i i've never you know thought about that before but it's just i think what it what it is is more of just this time period like it wouldn't be that impressive if it was more modern times than like the 20th or 21st century because it'd be very easy to get from point a to point b but I think just back then, before they had automobiles and stuff, um, it's kind of impressive how much they traveled around. But the Prussians suddenly agreed an armistice with the Russians, leaving the loyal remnants of Macdonald's corps to fight their way back to Poland. By 1813, Napoleon relied on Macdonald as one of his senior marshals. In August, he gave him command of the forces keeping watch on General Blücher's army of Silesia. But when Macdonald advanced across the Katzbach River, torrential rain and flooding caused chaos among his troops, just as they encountered Blücher's army. Blücher launched an immediate attack, and Macdonald's army was routed. Thousands of his new conscripts surrendered or deserted. Hundreds were driven into the river itself. Macdonald took full responsibility for the disaster, though his lack of cavalry and some bad luck were also to blame. Napoleon certainly continued to respect Macdonald's military judgment. He continued to command 11th Corps and was in the thick of the fighting at Leipzig two months later. 
Macdonald was with the rearguard when the French retreat began, and was shocked to see the chaos that engulfed the army. When the Elster Bridge was blown too early, he himself was trapped on the wrong side of the river, and just managed to swim to safety under enemy fire. Macdonald continued to serve Napoleon as a loyal and reliable commander throughout the 1814 campaign, effectively serving as his deputy at several key moments. Unlike most marshals, Macdonald was never under Napoleon's spell, and always spoke his mind to the Emperor. This in itself was a valuable service, though it sometimes led to heated arguments. Perhaps inevitably, in April, it was Macdonald and Ney who took the lead in confronting Napoleon with the facts of his situation. The war was lost, and he must abdicate. Napoleon named Macdonald as one of the three men who would negotiate with the Allies, telling his foreign minister, the Marquis de Colincourt, Macdonald does not like me, but he is a man of his word, of high <laughs> principles, and he can be relied on. In their last meeting, a few days later, Napoleon told Macdonald, I did not know you well. I was prejudiced against you. I have done so much for so many others who have abandoned me. And you, who owe me nothing, have remained faithful. I appreciate your loyalty. Too late. Macdonald was kept on as a military advisor by France's restored Bourbon monarchy. He continued to speak his mind, so much so that Louis XVIII nicknamed him his outspokenness. During the Hundred Days, Macdonald remained loyal to the king, and attempted to rally troops to fight against Napoleon. When he saw this was futile, he escorted the king to safety in Belgium, then returned to Paris, where he refused to meet with Napoleon. After the defeat at Waterloo, he was put in charge of demobilising the last elements of Napoleon's Grande Armée, and helped many officers to escape arrest by the Bourbons. Macdonald was a methodical, reliable if unspectacular commander. But he distinguished himself above all by his lack of vanity or personal ambition, his complete loyalty to France, and his willingness to speak his mind, virtues that were all too rare among Napoleon's marshals. Seven, Messina. Marshal Massena. Or Massena. I definitely remember this guy from the Napoleonic Wars for sure. Uh, he came alive when surrounded by danger. When defeated, he was always ready to begin again as if he was in fact the victor. Okay, so a very optimistic guy, sounds like. André Massena was born in Nice, at that time not technically part of France, but of the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. His father, a shopkeeper, died when he was young, so he ran away to sea, then at 17 enlisted in the French army. He was quickly made a sergeant, but a commoner could rise no higher in the Royal Army, so after 14 years service he quit. When the French Revolution began, he re-enlisted in a local volunteer battalion. Massena, supremely self-confident and unfazed by any challenge, was elected to command the battalion, and led it with success against the Austrians on the Piedmontese front. Despite his lack of education, he proved an instinctive combat leader. He was soon promoted to brigadier, and after leading a successful attack at the Siege of Toulon, was made General of Division. He won an impressive victory over the Austrians at Loano in 1795, and when the Army of Italy's commander, General Scherer, resigned over lack of support from the government in Paris, many expected Massena to replace him. Instead, the job went to the 26-year-old General Bonaparte, 11 years younger and much less experienced than Massena, but with far better political connections. Nevertheless, Napoleon and Massena worked together brilliantly. Massena commanded his advance guard, and played a major role in several of his early victories. In reports, Napoleon described Massena as active, tireless, audacious, 
He won so many battles that Napoleon acclaimed him l'enfant gâté de la victoire, the spoiled child of victory. <laughs> Massena was, however, notorious for extorting vast sums from the local Italians, often while his own troops went hungry and without pay. In 1798, Massena received his first independent command, the Army of Switzerland. The next spring, after French defeats on the Rhine and in Italy, responsibility for the defence of France lay in his hands. Rather than wait to be encircled, he attacked and won a brilliant victory over Austrian and Russian forces at the Battle of Zurich. Rewarded with command of the Army of Italy, Massena led a heroic defence of Genoa in 1800. He was eventually starved into surrender, but his stubborn defence bought Napoleon enough time to cross the Alps and defeat the Austrians at Marengo. Physically exhausted by this last ordeal, and surrounded by accusations of corruption, Massena was recalled to Paris and went into semi-retirement. When he was made a marshal by Napoleon in 1804, he seemed distinctly underwhelmed, and on being congratulated, remarked, there are 14 of us. <laughs> but Massena was one of the few marshals who'd proved themselves in independent command, making him a priceless asset to Napoleon. In 1805, he was recalled to active service and given command of the Army of Italy in the war against the Third Coalition. Massena kept Archduke Charles' army busy in Italy, while the Emperor won his great victories at Ulm and Austerlitz. In 1806, Massena oversaw the occupation of the Kingdom of Naples, ordering brutal reprisals against local resistance. In 1807, he commanded V Corps in Poland, but his role covering Warsaw meant he missed the major battles of Eylau and Friedland. Later that year, while out hunting with the Emperor and his entourage at Fontainebleau, he was accidentally shot in the face and lost the use of an eye. Napoleon, a notoriously bad shot, was to blame, but the loyal Marshal Berthier claimed responsibility. Wait, what? Napoleon oh. shot him? What? I, I don't think I heard that at Fontainebleau, right. he was accidentally shot in the face and lost the use of an eye. Napoleon, a notoriously bad shot, was to blame, but the loyal Marshal Berthier claimed responsibility. Okay, first of all, I'm surprised by a couple of things. Napoleon was a bad shot, so he was like this really famous military commander, and he, did, he wasn't good at shooting. Um, secondly, he shot a guy in the face? How does that happen? I mean, I guess, like, if you're not careful, it can happen, but oh my gosh. Napoleon, <laughs> Napoleon shot a guy in the face accidentally. That's hilarious. It's not, it's not funny. Like, nobody getting shot is funny, but it's kind of hilarious that this great, you know, genius military commander made a really dumb mistake like that. <laughs> but the loyal Marshal Berthier claimed responsibility. The war against Austria in 1809 saw Massena back near his best. His corps formed the vanguard for the crossing of the Danube, and fought ferociously to hold the village of Aspern against an overwhelming Austrian onslaught. Massena was everywhere, displaying his usual coolness under fire, and when ordered to retreat, ensured his troops pulled back across the river in good order. The battle was a defeat, but Massena had been superb. Together, he and the Emperor oversaw preparations for the next attempt to cross the Danube six weeks later. The Austrians were waiting for them at the Battle of Wagram. Because of a riding accident a few days earlier, Massena had to command his corps from a carriage. He made a fine target for Austrian gunners but was still able to organise a complex redeployment of his corps at the height of the battle, covered by Marshal Bessières' cavalry charge. Massena's bold manoeuvre secured the French left flank and won further praise from Napoleon. Massena, already ennobled as the Duke of Rivoli, 
received a new title, Prince of Essling, and another less welcome reward, command of French forces for the invasion of Portugal. Massena was deeply reluctant to go, and complained bitterly about his appointment. He was showing clear signs of exhaustion, and was plagued by rheumatism and bad lungs. When he arrived in Spain, General Foy observed, He's only 52, but he looks more than 60. He's lost weight and has begun to stoop. His glance, since the accident in which he lost an eye, has lost its keenness. His subordinates, already underwhelmed by his appearance, were outraged that the Marshal also decided to bring along his mistress, poorly disguised as an officer of dragoons. The French okay. invasion of Portugal proved a disaster. Undone by Wellington's scorched earth tactics, a hostile population and terrain, and Massena's own lethargic leadership. His corps commanders, especially Marshal Ney, were scathing of his conduct. At Busaco, Massena squandered lives with an unnecessary frontal attack on a strong British position. When he reached Lisbon, he found the city protected by new fortifications, the impregnable lines of Torres Vedras. Massena waited outside Lisbon for reinforcements that never came, while sickness and guerrilla raids took their toll on his army. Five months later, he recrossed the mountains back into Spain, leaving a string of devastated villages behind him. The next summer, at Fuentes de Oñoro, Massena attacked Wellington's army once more, and despite much hard fighting, again failed to win a clear victory. He blamed Marshal Bessier for his lack of support. But the Emperor's patience was at an end. He sent Marshal Marmont to replace Massena. And when they next met, greeted him with the cutting words, So, Prince of Essling, you are no longer Massena. Massena's health was now in steep decline. He never held a major command again, though he was recalled in 1813 to supervise a military district in southern France. He died after a long illness in 1817. In his prime, Massena was a superb commander, incisive and dangerous. But he was past his best by the time he became a marshal. Nevertheless, there were enough sparks of his old brilliance to worry his adversaries. The Duke of Wellington once remarked, When Massena was opposed to me in the field, I never slept comfortably. Mm. Bessier, Macdonald, Massena. Twenty down, six to go. Join us for the next part of Napoleon's Marshals as we reveal our top six, coming soon. Okay, well, I can't believe we only did three marshals. It seemed like we were doing more than that, but they're spending more and more time on each marshal as we get further along in this series. I think the next video is like 38 minutes, and then the one after that is like 42. So I, I have a feeling they're going to split it between, you know, three and three for the next couple of videos. So they're going to spend a lot of time on the on these last six marshals. So some pretty impressive um, marshals in that one. I did like totally mistake McDonald for another marshal. I don't even know who I'm thinking about in Spain. Maybe you guys can um, enlighten me on that. But I feel like it was it was a marshal that was sent down there and he just did like a horrible job for Napoleon. <laughs> That's the one I'm thinking about. Maybe he just kind of looks a little bit like the other guy. But I can see the progression how these, these marshals are getting a little bit better and better as we go through these videos. Again, I just like Bernadotte for some reason. I think it's just like the whole package for me with him and that's why he's my favorite so far. I wasn't particularly like drawn to any of these guys to replace him as my number one, but I do see like militarily how they were probably better marshals than Bernadotte was. Let me know down in the comments if any of these are your favorite marshal and then tell me why. And also, I can't even remember if I asked any questions in this. I feel like it was more of just like comments that I had than questions but if I did ask any questions make sure you answer them in the comments for me or just add you know more info if you want to do that looking forward to seeing who the top six are obviously DeVoe is going to be in there I expect him again like I said in the last video I think to be number one or two if he's number two I'd be very interested to know who is number one but I think he's going to be number one I'm pretty sure
sure. I have a feeling that he's gonna be number one. So another quick reminder to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Check out my links to social media and Discord. Roger here and I want to thank you for watching as always, and we will see you guys next time for part five.